Hey folks, Alan Mandic, the Hot Rod Hippie here. This week's video, we're talking about bossing mounts, also known as blocking hammers. We're gonna be talking about uses in metal shaping and the different types of hammers that are out there. So let's check it out. Now I have shown hammers like this in use on this channel before, but I've never specifically discussed the hammers themselves. That's what we're doing in this video here. It's not gonna be an in-depth how to use a bossing mallet video. It's more gonna be an introduction to what they are, the different types that are available, the ones that I personally use, and I am gonna show some of how to use them and what they can do. They can both stretch and shrink metal, and we're gonna demonstrate that here in this video a little bit. Now I've tried to define metal shaping terms on here before. I have a dedicated video to that you should check out at the link up here because that will help you understand what I'm talking about a little bit better. But there was a term that I didn't cover in there and that was blocking or bossing. And that's what these hammers are intended for. If you ever see somebody shaping metal and they're working on a sandbag or a stump and you see that their metal kind of looks like a bag of walnuts, it's got those lumpy points on it, that's because they're trying to rapidly, quickly form the overall rough shape that they're looking for into that metal. And that's what these hammers are for. Now, before we break down the specific hammers, there are two pieces of equipment that generally go with hammers in their uses. And that is either a leather shot bag or a shrinking stump. A leather shot bag is just a leather bag filled with either sand or in my case, lead shot, such as would be in a shotgun shell. And you use that to rapidly shape metal and form it quickly through pretty much entirely stretching application. Then you have a stump. A stump is the opposite in that it is intended for shrinking applications. It actually allows you to gather metal up, thicken it a little bit, and form shapes via that process rather than stretching. Probably the most common thing that you're used to seeing with one of these mallets is a leather shot bag. You'll see a lot of companies selling these cheap kits where it comes with a leather shot bag and a really cheap hammer to begin as your beginner metal shaping toolkit. And honestly, that is a pretty good way to start out. It gets you a lot of fundamentals in metal shaping right off the bat. You can learn shrinking and stretching, mostly stretching, through using one of these things pretty simply. So let's go ahead and demonstrate what I'm talking about there. Now, I'm not trying to create anything specific here. I'm just grabbing a piece of scrap metal and I'm gonna attack it. I scribed a little line on there with the face of the hammer and I'm gonna go ahead and follow along with that, try to create kind of a curved shape into this piece of aluminum. I'm gonna start out by just striking the metal into the leather shot bag with the mallet. What I'm doing there is creating stretch points. I'm rapidly stretching that by giving that metal something to rest against that gives with the leather shot bag, the hammer forces its way into the metal, stretching specific points where it strikes. The smaller contact patch that you use to strike the metal, such as the higher radius, more rounded off end of this mallet that I'm using, the more rapidly it will stretch the metal, leaving much more prominent strike points that you have to work out of there, but it does more rapidly rapidly move the metal. That can work for you and against you. If you're trying to quickly roughly shape out a piece and you know how to control it, this can work in your favor. If you're not so controlled with it, you can overstretch an area very easily and ruin the piece that you're working with. When you're using one of these mallets, it's very, very easy to go too far too quickly, so you really wanna take it in steps. Hammer out a little bit, check that you're getting the shape that you want. Hammer out a little more, continue to check that you're getting the shape you want. Maybe smooth it out before you continue, and so on and so on. Now, if I'm really trying to create, say, a fender shape out of this, I would end up going to either the English wheel or the planishing hammer to go ahead and smooth out between those different points. I wanna go from, say, high point to high point and blend the area in between them to match up with that. Now, since this is a blocking hammer video, I'm not breaking out the English wheel or the planishing hammer. I'm just gonna demonstrate the use of the hammer. So to smooth out those high points from one to the other, I'm gonna flip back over my hammer and use the lower radius end of the hammer to kind of smooth between those different points. Again, striking into the shot bag, but at a lighter pressure, hitting it softer just to blend from one high to the other and kind of move the metal into a more uniform shape. You can also use a hammer and dolly to smooth out the metal. It's just going to take you significantly longer than an English wheel or a planishing hammer would. So obviously that was a very brief introduction to the concept of stretching metal with a shot bag. Now the other common form of metal shaping you've probably seen around somewhere, you may have even seen it and not realized it, is stump shrinking or stump forming. Now this is a shrinking stump I made a couple of years ago and honestly it wasn't a particularly good one. It works and I will demonstrate using it here. This is based off of the design that Ray Shaleen at Pro Shaper Sheet Metal uses where he creates it out of say four by fours or various chunks of easily available lumber rather than going out and finding a hardwood legitimate stump to create it out of. We will be doing a dedicated video to making a shrinking stump in the old fashioned actual stump fashion in the not too distant future. I've already got a stump set aside, ready to go. I'm just waiting for some good weather because it's gonna make a mess, so I'm gonna do it outside. 
Despite the fact this stump isn't what I want it to be, it can still work for what we're talking about here. So let's go ahead and use it to shrink some sheet metal here. Now you can see this piece of sheet metal that I was shaping in the shot bag. As I'm shaping it, I'm creating that stretch in there. You can see that the edges of the panel start to wrinkle up. They get this kind of potato chippy wavy pattern to them. And that's what I want to see for shrinking. I'm going to take those wrinkles and I'm going to set them onto a flat section of the stump. And this is where a regular stump versus this style of stump would probably come in more handy because they have a more uniform flat surface. But we will show that when I build that stump for you folks. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the bossing mount to strike onto the top of that wrinkle and kind of gather the metal in on itself. As it digs into the wood surface and the plastic surface on the mallet, it doesn't just flatten back out like it would if you were hammering it against metal. Instead, it actually kind of gets stuck on the wood and forces itself in on itself. You're actually gathering more of the material surrounding it and hammering it into one section, meaning that that piece of material, say if it started at 0.045 inch thick, at the end, it could be 0.046 inch thick. So it's actually creating a thicker piece of material. That's what you're doing when you're shrinking. I'm gonna go along with all of these wrinkles and I'm gonna hammer in on them with the hammer here. Now, something you should note is I'm not driving down into this material as hard as I can. I'm hitting it with a glancing blow. The reason that I do that is it's easier to control because if I was striking dead down into the material, I would have a greater chance of stretching it. I would get to the point where I gather the material up, I hammer it down into the wood, but then the hammer kind of continues and then it would actually act as a stretch. That's not what we're looking to do. We're looking to shrink. So it's lighter glancing blows that allow me to kind of skip off of the material. It makes it go slower, but it also means more control in my shrink. Now you can see here with this piece, the middle of the panel has a little bit of a hump to it from where I stretched it, but the edge of it rapidly falls off and has a much harder radius on it. That is because of the shrink. I've actually taken that material, I've pulled it down around the corner by reducing the overall length of that side of the panel basically, and it creates a curve both one way and the other way on this panel. Now in this video and videos going forward, I'm gonna to continue to throw out terms, shrink, stretch, form. Those are metal shaping terms. I have a whole dedicated video explaining those, eight metal shaping terms defined. Check that video out, link is in the description down below. You need to learn those terms because I'm not gonna define them every single time I bring them up. You need to learn what I'm talking about when I'm referring to those different terms. Now let's move on to actually talking about the specific hammers, the ones that I use and the other ones that are available on the market. Now you can see this four piece mallet set that I have in front of me here. These are bossing mallets from the folks at Ron Fournier Enterprises. These are personally some of my favorite hammers that are out there. Now these hammers have the UHMW plastic heads on them. I really like that personally. They're good for working on softer materials like copper or aluminum, as well as harder materials like steel, because as you're shaping on those materials, these are abrasion resistant. So they will hold up to the heavier, harder materials like steel and they're also non-marring so they'll leave less marks on the softer materials. Now ideally you would have two sets of hammers, one for the softer non-ferrous materials and one for the ferrous materials so you're not cross-contaminating particles between the two of them. I personally do not have that at the moment though I really should invest in doing so. Now when it comes to these Ron Fournier hammers the biggest things that I like are the weight and the size of them. These things are much heftier than the cheap plastic hammers you're going to find at car shows for sale or from these different parts catalog companies who tell you these little dinky hammers those things weigh so little that trying to move any real metal with them like even 18 gauge steel is a battle these hammers here not the case they move metal much quicker and easier so when you only want to lightly strike the material it requires a little more effort on your arm strength to keep from striking hard with these hammers but you have to find the balance line there I would rather have the ability to strike hard than not have it, and that's what I like about these hammers. Now the other part of that, size. What I mean by that is the actual size of the head of these things. If you look at some of the other hammers, those cheap ones I was referring to, they are much, much smaller heads, meaning that when you're trying to reach into a panel, it is much more difficult. The material curls up and around what you're working on, where you're striking, and it creates a dish, a depth to that panel. As the panel gets deeper, one of those smaller mallets wouldn't be able to reach in there without smashing your knuckles on the side of it. These hammers also have a range of radii. There are no radiuses repeated on these hammers at any point. Each of these ones has a different radii on the face, meaning that I can use different shaping portions of them to create different shapes in material. If I wanna use a flatter, softer radius to create a much more gentle curve, I can. If I wanna have a really, really pointy one to create quick stretch in a panel, I can do that with, say, this really rounded off one here. And the last one I have for Ron Fournier is this barrel mallet. This is flat on both sides with a hefty head on it. You could use this to reshape one side into whatever shape you want to have on it, 
or you can just use it to flatten out material. This is really good for shrinking. As I was showing, flattening that wrinkled out section on that panel on the stump, this could be really good for flattening out those shrinks because it's got a good flat face on it. As the panel becomes more curved, it might not be right and you might have to move to the rounded one that I was using in that situation. The other thing that I will use this barrel mallet for is actually for flattening out pieces. I showed in one of my hammer forming videos making a speed ballister with a flat flange around the edge of it. You can check out that video at the link up here. When I was doing that, that flat flange around the edge of it, if I needed to get any wrinkles out of that flange and flatten it out, I would use this barrel mallet. But the way I would probably use it is actually just to rest the barrel mallet against that and hold it there. And I would use another hammer to strike on the backside of the barrel. That way I'm not worrying about where my hammer is positioned because I can easily control that and I only have to control the other hammer striking the mallet. You do have to redress the face of these hammers once in a while. They will get marred up and dinged up over time from the wrinkles and the edges as you're working with them. I generally break out the DA and reface them just as I did when I actually work on my body hammers as well. Obviously it goes quicker and easier since they are just plastic. Now let's talk about some of the other hammers on the market. I've just talked about the plastic ones. There are also wooden ones and metal ones as well as dead blow hammers. The wooden ones basically have all the same benefits as the plastic ones. The non-marring, reshapable, a good heft to them, a good weight, and the wood acts as a bit of a shock absorber as well. They're often even a little bit heavier than these plastic ones that I have, especially when you compare them to the cheap plastic ones that are significantly heavier than that. Personally, I don't own any of the wood ones. I find that they are a little bit prone to breaking down more over time than the plastic ones are. The surface face on them can mar up a little bit, a little bit easier than the plastic ones do, and it might be deeper in the material and harder to redress. You have a chance of chipping or cracking it when you strike on the edge of the thing. You might need to oil the heads of them just keep them from drying out too much over time and cracking on their own. It's going to be up to you whether or not you find that useful. The thing about the wooden ones is it's probably likelier that you have access to somebody who could make you wooden ones or you can make your own wooden ones than the plastic will be. Next up are steel mallets. Steel mallets seem to come in one of two forms, either a dead blow fashion where it's a shot filled head or just a solid cast head design like a traditional hammer is. Steel mallets are good for rapidly moving metal, especially if you're talking about working with steel. If you're working with 18 gauge or 16 gauge steel on a regular basis, it's probably worth investing in some steel metal shaping bossing hammers. The shot filled head designs like the one from Ron Fournier have a much smaller head design that I find harder to get into deeper stretch and shrink areas. So I don't really love that, but it has the shot filled head for a bit of shock absorption. So you're not feeling all of that force into your arm and creating a slightly stronger strike force in the head itself. Because of their smaller contact patch, you are using these for rapid metal shaping. As I showed with the other hammers, you don't have the softer, flatter, larger face to spread out the load. You are striking in a specific area. That's good for quickly shaping things, but not for fine work usually. I personally find that this is one of those idiosyncratic things where I don't see the steel ones used in the USA as commonly as over in Australia and Europe. But I would really like personally to pick up one of the cast iron ones from like Peter Tomasini down in Australia. He has some nice design ones, I think, anyway. And the last thing is a fairly obvious thing. Because these steel ones are steel, they are much more likely to leave tooling and hammer marks on the material. Especially if you're talking about trying to use these on something like aluminum. I'm not saying you can't. You can. However, you are more likely to leave marks and scars in the material with a steel face than you are with a plastic one. That's why you really need to maintain the face of, just like your body hammers, a good clean surface on the face of it, polished up finish on there, which most of them do come with, so that you can use it and have a clean strike surface on your hammer. Next up are dead blow hammers. These are basically the same concept of teardrop hammer design like I'm showing you here, but they have a steel inner core with shot inside of it. That acts as both a shock absorber and actually an increase in force because the shot swings back as you swing back and swings forward as you swing forward, creating a little bit more impact force. That steel inner core is wrapped in a polyurethane body to create a non-marring surface. Some people really like these and I can see the appeal. They create less fatigue on your joints. As I said earlier, these plastic ones, they start to hurt the arm pretty quickly. So the shock absorption of the dead blow one can be pretty nice to have in your rapid shaping applications. The dead blows are also slightly pricier than either a wood or a solid plastic mount like these here, since there is more to the construction of them than these entail. 
Next up is the interchangeable hammer design. These are available from like Racheline at Pro Shaper Sheet Metal and Hoosier Profiles used to sell them. I don't know if they sell them anymore, however. The idea here is you have a machined head on this thing that has interchangeable ends that accept different tooling for the hammer. So you could put a plastic hammer head on one side and a metal hammer head on the other side. You could have different radiuses on each side and you could interchange those heads for your applications. You have those options. And also if you have access to something like a lathe or a mill, you can make custom tooling for these as well as you feel the need. You could buy material like from McMaster Car, as I mentioned earlier, and make your own. You can make the steel or aluminum heads for whatever applications you're trying to work with. Another nice thing is they take up less space than these. I've got these big barrel mallets floating around here. Those interchangeable head ones have a smaller head design to begin with, and then the actual interchangeable heads, while not small, they are much smaller than these hammers are, so it makes it a little easier for storing things. You could maybe put 10 freaking interchangeable ends into one drawer and just the one hammer handle to work with versus all of these hammers that I have. Along with all that, because they are machined to spec and they are not made in a mass production situation, those interchangeable hammer heads are the most expensive option that I'm showing you, at least in the respect of buying just one hammer. The set of hammers, the four that I have here, is almost half as much as one of the interchangeable hammers is. Now I know this was a brief introduction to these concepts, there's a lot more to discuss here and we will cover this more in future videos, especially when we talk about making our own shrinking stump. I'll show you how I'll do that, we'll demonstrate shrinking with the stump more, we'll break this down more in future videos, so please get subscribed to keep up to date with that. You can find links in the description down below to all the hammers I've been discussing here, even the ones I don't have, I threw some links down there, so if you're interested in a steel one, something like that, you can check it out, the links in the description down below. Alright folks, I hope you found this video interesting, if you did, please go ahead and drop it a like. Let me know in the comments down below, what do you think of these bossing mallets? Do you have ones that you like that I should check out? Do you like this information? Did you learn something here? Let me know in the comments down below. Get subscribed to keep up to date with all the content on the Hot Rod Hippie channel coming up. Thanks for coming around, folks. Oops.